What's up? I'm Dan Fradenberg, and this is another Chance Encounter. Hey, what's up? I'm Dan Fradenberg. I'm a commercial real estate guy. I'm from the internet. We're seeing uh, we're seeing more properties like this being built in front of a house. It's going to be torn down soon. I understand that there are power lines that are just kind of close. What's up again? This is Dan Fradenberg, and that there is a commercial real estate building. I'm joined today with Joseph Harris the Third. How you doing today, Joseph? I'm good, Dan. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's definitely my pleasure, and I'm I've got you here today because we're being joined by my very favorite audience member. My very favorite audience member is here because this is a chance encounter where I interview commercial real estate investors, syndicators, and operators, and I'm finding out, hey, what are you doing? Part of it is because it's the law, and then the other part is to find out if there's any overlap in our business, and so that's why these are just little 15-minute punchy ones. And don't forget, down over here somewhere, uh, if you hit the little gear, you can actually change the speed of these uh, of these interviews. I always watch them at two times speed, so you can often finish them in only seven and a half minutes, which is pretty amazing. But before we get too excited about that, Joseph, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit to the audience? Yeah, my name is Joseph Harris III. I'm a multi-family syndicator focused on um, North Carolina and South Carolina and, and, um, and also Virginia markets. And uh, I've been I've been in the game for a couple of years now. Just so just switching over from single family coming into multifamily. All right, beautiful. And uh, I love having people who've already uh, got some experience in all this kind of stuff. Uh, but sometimes, here we go. Now we're back. Uh, there's one thing we need to do first, which is I need you to check your eight, and that's uh, for you in the audience. It's your five. It's under here again. Joseph, can you see if the audience has subscribed yet? There's there, there's if there's a red button for them. Like, like can you can you make that out or no? <laughs> Not really <Yeah>. sure. <laughs> make sure you subscribe. It's very important. But anyway, so let's talk about the distinct motivations. And the reason why I start off with motivations in these interviews is because everybody knows why they're doing it, but some people don't know what they're going to be doing in it. So that's why I start off here. So the first reason why some people want to make their next acquisition is because they are preserving their purchasing power. That means they've already got a nest egg. And in a lot of cases like family offices or whatever, they depend on the cash flow that comes from their assets to make ends meet. So if inflation gets a little bit out of hand, it's time to make a new acquisition to uh, stave that off. Now that's not what I'm really up to. That's not my big priority right this second. My big priority is trading time directly for wealth instead of wages or salary. And the reason for that is because my background is in technology. That means I'm a high wage earner, right? But the problem with learning, uh, earning a lot in the form of wages and salary is you get taxed way more than anybody else. So it hit me, it's like, well, well, what if I get involved in the acquisitions of these deals or the runnings and all that kind of fun stuff? And then that way I'm getting uh, capital that's deployed instead of uh, that intermediate step being a problem. So that's what I'm up to. But most people, when they first start thinking about moving into real estate, they're either trying to leave the door open for retirement or they're trying to fast track it. But the other way of putting it is that they're just looking to get more control over their time. So that might mean working fewer months per year or fewer weeks per, per month or uh, fewer hours per week. That's what some people are up to, but there's a lot of them out there where that's not them at all. They're going to keep on hustling forever and ever. Like the people who are so ambitious, they want to buy their entire hometown. They're looking for that generational wealth. They want to make sure that they're, even their great-grandchildren never have to hold a day job. So that's what some people are up to. They're great because they'll be hustling into their 90s. And the other group that will keep on working into their 90s are the people who they found maybe a sector of society or maybe it's animals, the environment, maybe they want to send people to the moon. Regardless of what it is, these people are, I like to say, they're trying to save the world. But you need to have that financial backing if you're really going to make a huge impact. So that's what some people are up to. So uh, Joseph, of those five different motivations, what really jumped out to you? What, uh, what sounded and described you uh, most accurately? 
Uh, I guess the la- the 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 last one that you said with well, sitting next to the last one, um, yep. building generational wealth mm-hmm. from my family mm-hmm. and grandkids and great grandkids. That'd be nice too if it lasts that long. Exactly, exactly. I, I hear the big trick for that is uh, is uh, strategic use of insurance. So, so what you can do is apparently within 30 days, uh, you can actually take out a life insurance policy on, on an infant and you can put it in the name of their children that haven't even been born yet. And so that's a really neat way. <laughs> Right? Isn't that crazy? You'd never think of that. But anyway, the uh, next one that I have here for you, the next question is a little bit, uh, it's, it's a little bit weirder. So this is for your tolerance of risk. So please fill in the blank for this one. There are many popular investment asset classes, but I think blank is too risky. What's too risky uh, for you, especially compared to uh, commercial real estate uh, and likely multifamily in particular? I say crypto. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. I totally agree. It's, and, uh, uh, go ahead. And the, the reason being is to, because crypto is not a tangible asset. So I mm-hmm. like physical tangible assets. Like I actually like gold and silver. I haven't invested in gold and silver, but I, I plan on it because mm-hmm. it's, it's a tangible asset. Mm-hmm. 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 Yep. I, I, I like silver. It's nice because uh, it's not storing an entire month's worth of, uh, income in a single ounce but uh that's awesome so that's what you got here so now we can move on to the actual commercial real estate stuff which means i pull out the dan does deals commercial roll die and you can get your very own one of these printed out and show it to your friends at dandoesdeals.com i don't even ask for your email address which is a really stupid idea from a marketing perspective but what i really want is i want to make sure that you can effectively communicate on the subject of commercial real estate because if you are going to get ahead in this business you have to be able to do that so in every single chance encounter episode i go through all six of these so that you know how my guest fits in so let's start by talking about repositioners repositioners are acquisitions people so they're looking at a bunch of different properties and a bunch of different paperwork and what are they doing well the first thing they have to do there's a fancy word for it they call it underwriting and that means doing the math doing the arithmetic finding out first of all they're talking to the sellers so they're saying well is this building actually even making what this seller claims it is so that's the first part but the second part about the repositioner role is they're figuring out how can they change it aka reposition How can they change the property so it has more upside? Now, they have three main tools in their tool belt to pull that off. The first one is more advantageous lending from their financiers. If you can get a better deal on your loans from the bank, then that can turn into straight net operating uh, income increase. But that one, you know, it's, it's not something that you can control very much at all. So usually the repositioner is first going to depend on more efficient operations. They're going to say, how do we stop these Benjamins from going down these toilets. And there's more to operations to just unclogging toilets and taking out trash and mowing lawns and all that sort of fun stuff. Like one of them that I've been picked up for by some sponsorship teams is the marketing piece, which uh, sometimes uh, part of the marketing piece is known as uh, being a leasing agent. In other words, uh, making sure that that vacancy stays as low as, as humanly possible. So that's uh, that's one thing that people look to me for as well as the, uh, the programming aspect. Uh, to uh, automate a bunch of things. But operations these days, you know, it's real estate's been pretty hot over the last two years, if you haven't found that out. And so uh, operations probably isn't gonna be enough. So the repositioner often has to get a contractor team in there to end up fixing the place up. And then that way they can charge more rent to new tenants and they'll be happy to pay it. So that's the contractor piece. But if the repositioner has the problem that I have, see, I don't know if you know this or not, but I'm from the internet. And so that means I need locals. I need somebody who lives nearby who can be there in an hour or two because in an hour or two, I'd still be at the airport finding my passport. Who knows what it'd be? That's not going to be me. But uh, that's basically the team as most people think of it. But when the repositioner has the deal in hand, turns around to the financier and says, this is our plan. This is what we're going to do. One thing the financier is going to ask that I haven't mentioned yet is, who's your KP? Now, a lot of coaching programs, they don't really talk about sponsors and KPs uh, specifically, and this is what it's all about. If you want to be eligible 
for a commercial loan, then somebody in the fold has to already own a similar asset. So you can't just go ahead and say, hey, I got a bunch of rich buddies. I'm going to you know, get a loan and, and buy a 350 unit apartment complex. What's going to have to happen is you're going to have to have somebody in the fold who already owns a 350 unit apartment complex. The financiers will insist on that. But on top of that, you're also going to have to have a certain amount of liquidity. And then between the GP team, the different uh, owners, you have to have a balance sheet that's worth at least the amount of the loan and then you can be eligible but if you have all of those pieces you got yourself a commercial real estate deal so joseph as far as core competencies go what you're uh, likely to uh, contribute to the next deal uh, what do you got what do you do well what i do is uh, i'm focusing on capital raising so, mm -hmm. so finance uh, side. Mm -hmm. yeah the fine yeah that'll be a financier side so I'm building my investor list now so I, that I can raise capital on my deals in the future and also other people's deals. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So, and then you're uh, with where you are, are you willing to be the local guy uh, as long as it's uh, in the Carolinas or, or Virginia or? Uh... Yes, I will. Yep. I can be boots on the ground too. I have okay. no problem with that. Okay, great. So, uh, so we got a little bit of operation boots on the ground uh, part on there as well. So then as far as the perfect uh, deal for you, uh, I always ask for the, the buy box. And, and just so you know, when commercial investors are talking to each other, syndicators and whatnot, uh, when they ask what's your buy box, what's your ideal property, they're really asking for three things. The first one's the geography where are the buildings okay because some people you know they're not they might not want california for example because the laws are not very great for the landlords and everything is insanely expensive so you need to know what states uh, you need to know what counties more likely than not possibly even what neighborhoods so that's the first one the second one it has to do with the um uh the size of the of the property and with multifamily, we go by unit count which is the same as self-storage uh, mobile home parks goes off of slabs which is also like a unit account uh, and then uh, offices will also do that whereas uh, industrial for example and warehousing will go off a of square footage so you need to know the size then the third thing, unfortunately, they use the same word for two things, which is class. And the first meaning of class has to do with the condition of the building. So is it old and beat up or is it brand new and ho-hum or is it brand new and super duper luxurious? OK, that's, you know, the different versions of class to give an idea of it. But the other meaning of class has to do with where the building is in terms of what's the crime rate like? What are the school districts like? And both of those two versions of class are rated the same way, just like in grade school, where it's like A minus, B plus, C plus and so on like that. So Joseph, uh, for you guys, uh, what's the property that's easier to say yes to and more difficult to say no to? The easier to say yes to would be a class B property mm -hmm. uh, between 50 units up to 200 units. Mm -hmm. And and then my target MSAs or or market areas that I'm focusing on uh, um, between the Carolinas and Virginia would be the Virginia Beach area, mm -hmm. and also the Raleigh Dorm area in North Carolina, mm -hmm. and in the Myrtle Beach area. All right, perfect, perfect. So then the next question would have to be about who you are ready to help. And one of my favorite things about commercial. Uh, real estate is that because it's multifaceted, you got these different players that are involved doing completely different things, and nobody's really going to be doing all six for any meaningful amount of time. So we're all better prepared to help some people than others, and we have our own specifications. Now, me because I am a uh, you know I've got the background in technology and marketing and all that kind of stuff. The uh, sponsors and KPs are who I'm looking for usually because they have the foundation already prepared for a guy like me to be fuel for the fire rather than just another grunt to uh, uh, do a bunch of uh, repetitive work. So that's who I'm looking for. Joseph, uh, who, who are you looking for? Is it more beginners? Like try not to uh, in, entice any investors, especially if you have any 506B raises going on, but uh, yeah. you know, so, so as far as like newbies or, or experienced people, KPs, like, like operators, who, who, who are you looking for most? I am looking for, I, I guess it'll be uh, main, main sponsors because I want to co-sponsor 
since I'm mm-hmm. I'm really just starting out into in multifamily. So I'm, I'll be looking for co-sponsors and um and KPs. Mm-hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. And and we caught up via LinkedIn. Everybody can find me real easy on uh, on LinkedIn. And you're you're very active on there. You, you've done some great contribution. The stuff I've been putting out and that put you on my radar. Uh, is LinkedIn the best place to reach you? Or is there a website or phone number, email? Like, what, What's the best way to reach you? The best way to reach me um, probably would be LinkedIn. But um, other than LinkedIn, you can also Call my cell phone at area code nine one zero seven eight nine two one nine zero, and or email me. Um, I haven't set up my website yet, but my email address is real dot estate dot syndication one o one at gmail dot com. Beautiful, beautiful. So the last thing that I've got is actually not for you, Joseph. It's for you in the audience. Well, I mentioned it earlier. I've got this campaign to stop the ugly red buttons. The buttons are ugly. They hurt my eyes when I look at it. It's under here. You'll see it. It's red and it's a subscribe and it's so bad. The only way to get rid of this awful red button is you click on it and then it turns into the gray button of tranquility which has a magical power the magical power is it means that youtube might start paying for these videos instead of me how cool is that right but jokes aside what it really means is that my videos might show up on your list of suggestions but you can go ahead and ignore those i just appreciate the fact that you spent this time with me just like joseph i really appreciate you spending the time with me it's been great getting to know you a little bit better i've been great talking to you too thank you for having me Awesome, perfect. Make sure you 506 B me. Any syndicators, make sure you 506 B me. Hi. Oh, hey, yeah, here's my code. You got your QR code scanner. Okay, yeah, oh yeah, just hold it right in the square there. Okay, cool, and now you hit open in browser. Okay. Okay, are you already logged into 506 B me? Yes. Yeah, okay, cool, yeah, so there's my video. So now I'm already on your watch list, so when you get back to your hotel, you can find out what my core competencies are and my level of sophistication. Sound good? Yeah. I love your hat. Real estate's a scam. That's really funny. Yeah, that's funny. Nice meeting you. You too. 506 B me, everybody.